All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us for a, a special press conference today. Uh, we called a, a press conference this morning because we uh, wanted to update the community uh, on what's going on with, with crime and public safety in our community, as well as uh, staffing and public safety staffing as well. Uh, with me is uh, our police chief, John Toom. Now, I'm going to make some opening remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over to the chief. Uh, to give some information, some statistics on what we're seeing with crime trends uh, here in Sioux Falls. So when I ran for office uh, four years ago now, when I was running for office, ran on a, uh, a tough on crime platform. And that platform uh, and that commitment uh, still holds true today. We've been very focused on public safety during my three and a half years in the office. And uh, that continues today, not only through the investments that we're making, but uh, through the support that we continue to provide to our men and women uh, in law enforcement. Um, we've been able to establish very strong relationships with our, uh, our police department. Uh, we got great leadership in our PD. Uh, we've got, got great union leadership right now uh, and very proud of the, uh, uh, the work we've done with our union leadership and the successful contract negotiations we've had. Um, one of the biggest wins that we've had, I think, in public safety in the last three and a half years has been the addition of, uh, of a police training academy here in Sioux Falls, uh, where previously we were sending those cadets to peer uh, through working with uh, the AG and others at the state. We we're able to have our own academy here in Sioux Falls. And in fact, Friday, uh, we just were able to graduate a class of 18, uh, I believe, from the class or from the academy here. And that's been huge in terms of getting uh, law enforcement professionals uh, uh, on the streets quicker, smoother, uh, and in a more efficient process. You know, our residents, when I talk with people in the community, there's really two things that they often talk about as non-negotiable expectations of their government. One is their infrastructure, their roads, their water, their sewer. Uh, but the second is public safety. It's usually what they want to talk about is public safety. What's going on with the safety of the community? Where are we at, Paul? Uh, you know, one of the reasons so many people have moved to Sioux Falls uh, in the recent years uh, is the safety of this community. There's a variety of reasons in the last 18 months that have brought people here, but one of them is certainly how safe this community is to live and raise a family. In 2020 uh, was a difficult year on a lot of fronts, and that included crime. Uh, cities across the country saw upticks in crime, saw upticks in homicides. Uh, we were no exception here. Uh, we also had crime upticks uh, in Sioux Falls in 2020 as well. But uh, fortunately, we're in a different place uh, in 2021. Uh, we've seen uh, a decrease uh, almost across the board in our violent crime stats, as you'll see shortly from Chief Toom. Uh, homicides, aggravated assaults, uh, domestic assaults, robberies are all down this year compared to last year. And because of the great detective work that we also do, we, we clear crimes, meaning we basically solve the cases uh, and make arrests quicker than the national average, uh, well below the national average. So we have a really great team that clears our, our cases quicker uh, than what a lot of communities across the country see. So to ensure that continues, we're continuing to make uh, these record investments like a public safety training center, like report to work locations, uh, training resources and so forth, but we're also continuing to make sure that we're properly staffed and that has led to people from across the country, uh, from uh, East Coast, West Coast, uh, down South, Minneapolis, Chicago, everywhere, uh, noticing Sioux Falls and wanting to come work uh, in law enforcement here. And they're coming for a few reasons. They're coming because they have community support here. Uh, we have a community that really does support our law enforcement professionals. Um, they also have uh, a mayor that's very supportive of public safety and an environment, a political environment, that's supportive of the work that they're doing here. And what's a win for us here in Sioux Falls is that we're getting good officers. We're getting officers with three, five, ten years or more experience that um, know what it takes to be a police officer because they've been doing the job. They want to just do it in a job where the politics can be pushed aside and they can serve their communities and answer the call to serve as law enforcement professionals. And Chief Toom is going to be touching on that as well. So I think the theme uh, that I'd like to reinforce overall, uh, and we'll be taking questions in the end, 
is that violent crime is down in Sioux Falls and in some cases significantly down over last year. That's a trend we obviously like to see uh, and that's a trend we're going to do our best to maintain uh, in the years ahead. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Chief Toom, who's going to walk, over, walk through some slides uh, on our uh, data. Chief? Well, it's important whenever we get the chance to uh, put in shots of our public safety training center. Like I said, we like to just bring this up as much as possible because it's such a huge symbol of the investment of our community into public safety. And I think, um, again, as some of the points the mayor touched on, that's something we, we always want to emphasize and, and really talk about how our community really understands the importance of a well-funded, well-trained public safety component. And so, of course, have to put in a few shots for you on that and the groundbreaking as well. But what we're going to talk about today is just some of the trends we've been seeing and, and how crime has, has changed and in, in what we've seen over the past year. Um, homicides are down. Sioux Falls has solved every homicide over the last 20 years. And we hold people accountable at a higher rate than the national average with clearance rates, as the mayor stated, above the national average. Now, you'll see these are stats through October, because obviously we want to run like stats. So these are through October of last year, but last year the total homicides was 13 for the city of Sioux Falls. And right now we're actually at five with a couple incidents that happened in November, but still well below what we saw last year and important of noting. And a lot of that is just something that we need to make sure we, we understand that again, we still are a metro area that measures our homicides in a remarkably small amount compared to, to other communities our size. Um, if we look at, at rapes this year, again, really very close and similar to what it was last year through October. Again, no major, major trends or any spikes that we're seeing or some things that are, are possibly being reported. Um, and here's a very important stat. Aggravated assaults, both aggravated assaults and domestic aggravated assaults, have seen a substantial decrease this year. And again, when we see a trend line usually for crimes that tend to follow very parallel to what our population is, to see a decrease in this category is a very positive thing. And I think one of the things that this gives us the opportunity to, especially when it comes to domestic assaults, is really talk about the partnerships we have with the Children's Inn, the Compass Center, Call to Freedom, many other people within the community who really pour time, effort, and energy into making these numbers go down because the reality is, is that people need resources and help sometimes to get out of these situations. And as we see with simple assaults as well as domestic simple assaults going down too, this is proof and evidence that partnership is working. And again, the investment that we're making in our community with a collaboration is key. Uh, many times as if you'll hear me say, police can't solve all the issues, but by partnering with the community, we can make an impact. And I think that's an evidence of that right there. Um, Looking again, robberies down as well substantially from the previous year, and that trend continues. And burglaries, however, on a slight uptick. Um, but again, as we look at the, the the trend line as far as calls for service, population growth, that's something we would predict and say that's about right in line with that trend line average, and something that really wouldn't surprise us for what we're seeing. Stolen vehicles, however, are up substantially. And we won't hide from that fact at all, that stolen vehicles continue to go up. And every Monday, we get a, an update from our detective bureau about how many stolen vehicles occurred over the weekend. Here's some recent highlights from you from the past couple weekends. I believe it was two or three weekends ago, 19 stolen vehicles, 18 with the keys in them, and one was a trailer. Um, the following weekend was nine stolen vehicles, eight with the keys in them. Uh, we, could probably put up a graphic of beating a dead horse because we've heard us say it I don't know how many times about what we're doing and how we need to keep ourselves from being victimized and I think it's something that we look at what can we do to avoid crimes and what can we do to, to prevent things from happening and this is one thing in fact we may institute every night at 10 o'clock we ask this, the people of Sioux Falls to check your car keys make sure they're not in your car lock your cars help us put these numbers down because this is a number that is directly in control of the residents of who live here. We'll do our best to hold people accountable, but a lot of times these stolen vehicles end up being used in other crimes or other things that really have more serious consequences. And again, with the stolen vehicle piece comes the other piece that we're often harping on, which is make sure your firearms are not left in your unsecured vehicles as we've seen them used in crimes again and again. Just one piece that we can work on as a community and again, every night at 10, 
I implore you, make sure where your car keys are, make sure your car is locked. Let's bring this number down together. Uh, larcenies, again, on a slight upward tick, but again, in line with our population and our call for service growth line. Nothing alarming there as far as a spike or anything that would cause us immediate concern. And vandalism's trending downward from last year as well. And again, all these numbers, just to paraphrase, are through October. We'll have end of the year stats that compare year to year, but we wanted to compare apples to apples. And so this is through October of last year compared to through October of 2021. Here's um, our uh, Sioux Falls uh, Minnehaha County Drug Area Task Force, which is comprised of the Sioux Falls Police Department, Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office, uh, state DCI, and numerous federal partners. Uh, they have absolutely been doing an outstanding job this year. Records amount of fentanyl seized this year, as you can see from this graph. Um, fentanyl, as we know, causes overdose issues, death issues. Is probably one of the more dangerous drugs you will see out there right now and it's important to note that we are seizing record amounts of fentanyl and often disguised as these m30 pills and other pills as well but um, again we've had an amazing successful year as far as what we've been able to seize methamphetamine as well uh, this is through october and we'll keep working through the end of the year but it wouldn't surprise me if we also end up with record amounts of methamphetamine or near record amounts of methamphetamine seized by this task force who does, again, outstanding work, proactive police work, going out and taking drugs off the streets. Here's the reality of that, though. Uh, what you'll see before you is graphs that cover the amount of known overdoses. These are overdoses that the police end up being involved in in some way, shape, or form. Again, and next to that is Narcan uses, and these are all from 2018 to 2021. Um, and then the following is deaths. So we are on pace for record overdose deaths, despite record amounts of seizures, despite record amounts of, of us being involved and trying to put more effort into it, deaths are on the rise and we will have a record, more than likely a record amount of deaths this year due to overdose. And here's where the community component comes in. Again, uh, you'll hear me say again, we, we deal with symptoms of bigger issues. We don't necessarily are able to solve overdose deaths by ourselves. This is where community partners family members identify issues that are out there and act early to intercede and make sure that we see these deaths go down. As having responded to numerous calls and many officers have responded to this call, there's nothing quite like telling the mother or father of a young person that they're no longer with us due to a drug overdose. And I think this is where I implore young people and who may be listening to this uh, and people in general, if you're thinking about using these types of narcotics, I want you to think and visualize your parents finding out that maybe uh, you've overdosed and passed away. Because for officers and EMS and for fire who go on these calls, this is a very real reality that we see. And these 26 numbers right here have names behind them. And again, this is where uh, we partner together as a community, look at different resources that are out there through the link or other other drug and out, drug counseling areas and say, okay, how can we make an uh, um, impact and how can we work with our families and our friends and our loved ones so that we do keep these statistics down. Um, along with some of the crime stuff, we're gonna talk about staffing levels and recruitment today. Again, here's an example of some of the advertisements we've been running to try to uh, attract and bring the best and brightest to Sioux Falls. Current staffing right now, we're at 270 sworn officers, of which 19 officers are in some measure of training, field training, and about 30 plus are in a prob probationary status, which means they're in the first um, 15 months of their employment, trying to earn the, their way onto the department and get off that probationary status. Our current authorized strength is 280 officers, and at the um, come 20 the next year, it'll be 284 as we add four more uh, sworn officer positions to this pool. Again, we're making great progress um, in a very difficult hiring environment, a very difficult climate, just not only for law enforcement, for everyone in the city to achieve staffing levels. Uh, for us, it's, it's key as we are really working hard to make sure that we can raise our staffing levels. One of the things we've been trying to do is try to find new creative ways to staff our shifts uh, that really optimize the public safety component but also give back to our employees. And this year with some staffing schedules as we move into the next year, 
86% of our patrol officers will be on a 10 hour schedule, which means they'll have three days off, work four, have three off, is a way to really just give them the time they need to as a city gets increasingly busy, have that work-life balance and give them time to kind of decompress from what can be a very busy work week. And again, we want to keep the well-being of our officers in mind because it's important to point out that they've been doing an outstanding job and they are working harder than ever. As our record call volume goes up, this is a, a price that's paid for by the officers as they, again, they are, are being worked very hard and we're, we're finding ways to build that work-life balance and get to full staffing to alleviate some of that stress. Again, the conversation comes up with applicants um, from South Dakota versus other states. And you, we have seen, uh, you see from 2019 to 2021, uh, an increase as far as officers out of state seeking employment with the Sioux Falls Police Department. And this is certified and uncertified officers. I think, like I said, it was, if we look at our police department, I can go out and try to sell our police department. We have an outstanding top-notch police department, but what we sell even more is our community. Our community is really second to none in numerous aspects, including the quality of life that's afforded here, but the partnership that they have with public safety and with law enforcement in general to be a very uh, law enforcement friendly city to work in. And I think that's why we're seeing these numbers and these correlations as we see more out of state officers look at moving here as people from all over the country look at moving here from a variety of industries and fields. And there's some hard statistics for you. In 2019, we about 19% of the applicants we had were certified. Uh, in 2020, 2021, excuse me, we've seen 40% of the applicants that we've had are, are certified employees, are certified officers from other states or from, from locally. And again, that's uh, a sign of, I think, people wanting to relocate here and work in a community where they're supported. And we have done some marketing um, here's just an example of some of the ads we've been running on either search engines or social media to really kind of get out there and, and put our community and our department out there. Um, and again, advertising and, and marketing is a, an, an exact science if you ask a police chief because, you know, we have to be constantly evaluating if we're getting results off this or not. We've only been doing this for a couple months and it really takes a little more time and statistical analysis to see uh, how this investment works, how we can curtail our marketing to really be the most impactful. But it's something we're trying to do because we want to, again, we want to keep our foot on the gas as far as keeping our staffing level high. And I think in many industries we see that right now where we have to be innovative, we have to try new things, and we have to keep our message out there and really do our, our best to attract the best and brightest. So in conclusion, uh, for this little slideshow portion, and then we'll get on to some of your questions. Um, again, what we, we see and what we hear sometimes, it's important to come back to some of the statistics and see where we're at. Uh, we are constantly monitoring trends. Every month I get an update uh, that we go through and, and dissect everything that we're seeing as far as crime trends, if they're up, if they're down, what are some of the correlations, pass that on to the mayor's office. And this is a constant evaluation that happens uh, from month to month. Uh, it seemed timely to talk about it as we get to the end of the year here and run some of these statistics out, but also know that they, they change on a day-to-day -day basis. Like I said, we had two more homicides in, in November where we haven't added because that was an October thing, but we're still at a pace where we're comfortable with where we're at and we're seeing positive trends and positive partnerships with the community. And again, um, again, we can't thank the community enough for their support and uh, excited for what the future holds, especially with the Public Safety Training Center and, and really moving forward uh, once Sioux Falls. All right, thanks, Chief. What, one last point I'd like to make, and then we'll take some questions, is um, the tip of the spear, really, for public safety is, is Metro 911. I mean, that, they're the people who answer those uh, calls for service. And we've also made some historic investments there with Metro Communications in uh, adding dispatchers uh, at a level that we haven't in quite some time, because um, the way the city budget historically works is this. We look at our population growth, we look at what we need in terms of officers and firefighters to serve a growing population, and those FTs are automatically inserted into the budget. We haven't historically done that with Metro 911. And so what's happened is uh, the calls for service and the call volumes at Metro 911 have expanded uh, dramatically over the last decade, but our dispatcher level has not kept up. So in addition to uh, supporting them with the staffing levels that they need, uh, they are also going to be beneficiaries of that Public Safety Training Center campus with a, a new state-of-the-art Metro 911 Dispatch Center, which will serve this, uh, this community and potentially this region for a lot of years to come. So uh, with that being said, uh, Chief or I are available for any questions you may have. Yeah. 
It's a little more more difficult than that, but it's it's a fair question. I think we can really look and find some easy answers when it comes to stolen vehicles, um, and we can look at other areas. and And I can't really provide for you a reason why our overdoses are going up. I mean, it's just it really comes down to there's a numerous societal issues. If you read other studies, well, what is this post pandemic lag that people are going through? Is this causing some other things? Are burglaries uh, up because more people were home last year, so less burglaries took place because they stayed home more. There's all these statistical correlations we can draw, and I think if we look at stuff and we literally analyze it, that's where we try to find inroads, and I think stolen vehicles is kind of low-hanging fruit on that one. We can identify that one, but as we see trends, we'll monitor them through the year, and I know we just kind of looked at the snapshot of the past two, three years, but if we really look at the calls for service all the way back to 2010 and related to our population growth, they seem to go up like parallel train tracks. They just kind of both escalate. And we see little dips and ebbs and flows. Uh, but I think we know we've we've kind of been able to identify trends and, and hopefully go after them where we can. So. Uh, come back to that a little bit. Um, is it that there's people who live here for 30 years or 20 years, sometimes see the results from two nights in the and two weeks in yeah. the and go, oh my gosh, it's, it is so bad. Yeah. Can you expand a little bit more on the relationship Yep. And so if, if you think about we're averaging, you know, between three to 5,000 people that we add to the community each year. But on top of that, the whole metro area continues to grow. Uh, we kind of talk about just Sioux Falls, but now we have to look at the surrounding communities, the growth in Harrisburg, T, Hartford, Brandon. A majority of this population comes to Sioux Falls to, to work, to shop, to do a variety of things. And so we really see the whole metro area grow and, and see, you know, and it, what we can say st statistically as that population grows, then that grows too. The other piece of it too is that we talk about how we consume news or media. Uh, we're still one of the few police departments in the country that provide a daily press brief. And so we are highlighting every day what's taking place, answering questions. We want to be transparent. We want to put what's happening out there. And again, I think if people are, are looking at the news they're, they're getting something from us almost every Monday through Friday about what's taking place. And I think as media has shifted, people's awareness of what's around them, social media presence, I think we're just seeing more awareness as the city grows because it's on everybody's mind, okay, how is Sioux Falls gonna handle this unprecedented growth? And we start to become more acutely aware to different things and crime is one of them. That and traffic and potholes, right? Are the, the, the primary things, right? So we just are more acutely aware of these facts. And I think for people who are lifelong Sioux Falls residents, and, and I'm one of them, I, we just kind of key in on that, watch those trends, and really want to hold on to what we have here because we feel it's something special for a city our size, and we want to make sure we maintain that public safety. And just to be clear, overall, crime rate is not surpassing our rate of growth. No, when we look at it, when we, we look at those numbers, that's about what we would predict. But we're always striving, again, with growth comes growth in other areas too. We'd like to keep it lower. We like, that's why we, the aggravated assault, the simple assault, especially the domestic pieces of those, to see those go down, I think is, is an encouraging piece for us. And we can look at, okay, what are our, our partnerships with these community programs and community other agencies really impacting inroads? Because again, especially when it comes to domestic assault, we can respond to numerous calls with the same person, but if we're not giving them resources, if resources aren't available to break that cycle, then it's really difficult to make an inroad on making impacts in those numbers. So, question for you is uh, you, you showed the statistic up there of out of state officers coming in and stuff like that. Yeah. Is there a process you, you showed that they're certified in that stuff? Is, there, is that saving us money by doing that or? Yeah. So if we look at the, the success rate of officers that go through training, there's a natural rate of attrition that takes place when we hire people because this job is very, very difficult. Um, and again, it's, it's difficult and for some people, they really don't find out that it's not for them until they get in. Certified officers typically have already kind of been through the fire a little bit. They understand what the job entails. They're more likely to, to really be successful within that process. 
The other piece that this allows us to do as far as saving money, we were limited to three hiring classes a year based off the state academy and when we would hire. Uh, by looking at certified only classes or core classes as we call them, we're able to expand our hiring to about five classes I think is what we'll get for, for 2021. So we're able to, to really get our machine rolling a little bit more to produce officers, find different ways to train them. We work our in-house training staff really hard. Uh, we said, you know, just get through 21 and 2022 so we can really get some unprecedented hiring and then we'll give you a break. But they're up for the challenge because they recognize, the whole department recognizes that getting us staff to, staff to an optimal level is a team effort. We'll pull instructors from all different parts of the department to make it work. And so that's what these core only classes will bring them in. And, and typically, if they perform well in field training, we can get them out on their own sooner than a uh, uh, uncertified officer who's being uh, trained from scratch. I think one, one, other, one other point I want to make on that, uh, and Chief can speak to this better than I, but, I, but it relates to that question is, these officers that we do see from out of market um, have validated what a high level of training that we do provide our officers here in Sioux Falls, because there are times when we have some officers with reciprocity who have come from large departments, large PDs from around the country, who um, we need to either retrain them or for the first time train them on things we expect of our officers here. Uh, and that just, it's been great for me to hear because it gives uh, me reassurance and kind of validation that the training standards that we have here in Sioux Falls are very, very high. Uh, and so while those officers that come in um, are already there, and as John said, they're already used to the chair and they've been doing the job, there's still some training aspects that we still need to invest in to make sure that they fit that Sioux Falls culture of excellence that we've really put a lot of money and effort and time into over the years. Yeah, and as I've said before, the, the bar is not sliding. Our standards are our standards and they need to be reached. And again, we'd rather have the right people than just a number, right? And so we're not going to compromise our, our standards or we're not going to compromise our training. Um, again, it's important you have the right people out, and that's what the community expects of us. I think we're working towards Alfonso. And so we, we take the applicants that come our way and we can't really pick and choose who comes through here. And so you'll see some diverse faces amongst the, the group that we're bringing in the next couple months here. Um, the diversity piece in recruitment of law enforcement is a complex topic. And again, I've talked about it at length recently and, and the efforts that we're needing to really diversify and make a police department that's representative of its community is actually uh, with middle school kids. I think we've talked about this. Like the, this has to start now. We're partnering with the community, with different community groups to say, hey, I know you're 12 now, but have you ever thought about being a Sioux Falls Police Department uh, officer? Because that's who we, we want. We want people from the community. And so again, we have to find ways to partner with different community groups to say, how can we help you? How can we meet you halfway to bring up people and, and really encourage them to get into a role in law enforcement? But yeah, it's a we put out our marketing, there's rules on marketing, on how you target and how you go out and how you do send your message. And so we'll continue to explore those options. But for me, I'm looking at when I'm eligible for retirement, uh, hopefully some of these ideas and plans that we'll be unveiling within the next year will be paying off because it's a long game. It's not a short game when you're talking about that topic. And if we had a, a formula to figure that one out, I think I'd retire and become a consultant for a lot of other companies around the country because that's the question within nursing, within teaching, with tons of other industries, how do we increase that diversity component? And I think that's something that'll be a work in progress throughout my, my tenure as chief as we collaborate and work on different ideas. So just specifically, if you look at our training program, it's complete and comprehensive. Everything from firearms to low light shooting, right? Are putting our officers in a variety of different conditions when it comes to when or where they, how they might use their firearms. Our less lethal training, how we take a taser and incorporate that into our defensive tactics training, how we have a de-escalation piece that can go along with that as well. We have a very set standard training regimen that we've always really followed. We've always been on the edge to make sure we're on industry best practices and standards. And so it's just important for us that we don't take things for granted when we bring people in. Uh, some things that we take for granted because we have support, time, 
and effort that really gets put into training. Uh, that's not the reality for a lot of agencies around the country who are horribly over understaffed, who are just struggling to put officers out. So we just want to make sure we check all the training boxes and make sure that the people we bring in are trained to the standards that we expect and more importantly the standards that the community expects from them. And we've seen outstanding candidates come in. Um, like some I've just been blown away at their level of professionalism and skill and others that just need a little bit more work. It's like any employee you hire, again, some need a little more training and, than others and, and some are just naturals and, and slide right in. No, you know, I think we'll we'll look at it kind of situationally. This is the first time as chief and the mayor and I are having a lot of discussions about trends and what we're seeing. Um, I would send this monthly update and I'd be looking at these stats and I would go out and do community presentations and people would ask it. We keep talking about how crimes so high and crimes way up. And what about this, this and this? And what are you doing? And I'm like, well, the, the stats tell a different story. So as we talked about it, we're like, let's just be transparent and open about the numbers that we see and what we're seeing right now and really just right before the holidays here before the end of the year so it doesn't get lost in the other shuffle we can just come out and make a statement when really there isn't any news to report other than we just want to be open and, and honest about what we're seeing and again we'll be transparent and honest if it was going the other direction I think last year with the rise in juvenile gun crime we were out there pretty loudly uh, talking about the trend we were seeing and how we weren't very pleased with what we were observing. So I think this is just a continuation of us really just trying to communicate and be open about what we're seeing. But also, if I go talk to a bunch of different groups, I only get an audience of about you know 20 at a time. If I can put some of this information out there and, and help people maybe understand what's going on in their city, I think that's, that's time well spent. And again, thanks for everybody coming today and covering it, because it's, it's something that we want our media to report to the public as well. And I think, uh, you know, Chief Burns and I did this last year, too, uh, just because to me it doesn't seem uh, totally fair to the public just to report on trends annually. Uh, but with as important as public safety is to a community, we should do this more often. Um, and there, there are times when we have uh, press conferences on building permits and road conditions and road budgets and seemed bizarre that we only report on crime trends once a year. So I think this will be a new trend where we'll do this more often so that the public is aware that uh, despite some, some, sometimes when there's coverage, the fact that we do a daily prime, uh, crime briefing, um, we'll sometimes craft a narrative that there's rampant crime. The truth is in the data and the data shows it's a very safe community uh, thanks to the work of our Sioux Falls Fire Department and our Sioux Falls Police Department. Any other questions for us? Yeah, if you look at it and you look at the, the age range, and from my personal experience, and I've, as a patrol officer, responded to numerous ones of these, uh, numerous call types like this, um, the ones that stick out the most are the young people between, in their teens or early 20s. And again, we talk about the impact this has, and we see it again and again. And I think it's important, I was thinking about, well, how do we really communicate to young people that this decision is bigger than just themselves. This is bigger than just popping a pill and having a good time or whatever other, other reasons or, or other struggles they have that bring them to this point. It's a decision bigger than themselves. And any officer or fire department or EMS worker who has sat with a grieving mother or listened to her cries, that's what sticks out in law enforcement's mind more than anything. Like that's what I remember about these calls. And so a lot of good people doing a lot of good work in the community. And I think it's just important that we remember the bigger impact of what these overdose deaths are. And it has a, a trail of wreckage it leaves behind. And I think if I can appeal to anybody listening to that today, especially young people, that's what I would want them to remember. So that's my way of sneaking that in there, Alfonso. So. I can't give you specifics, but if we, I mean, 
there's countless cases that we have from uh, from gun crimes or from seized seized firearms that were either on a car in a person where we run the serial number and come back with the not even just stolen from our community stolen from other communities I think one of the guns that we had stolen during some of the unrest last year ended up being used in a homicide in Chicago right the lieutenant Matina. yeah so I mean, we, we see this reaching impact that unsecured firearms usually don't end up in collectors hands right they end up in street crimes and, and having very negative outcomes um, and again just always a point worth bringing up as we try to do everything we can to keep our community safe and additionally too um, we want to keep people from potentially the impact of your gun gets stolen and then gets used in a crime like that's that's uh, obviously not something you want to experience because that's again um, something you have to carry around with you for a while and, and that's not a positive thing all right with that we're gonna um, move into our uh, daily press briefing I think Sam you leading that today so give everybody a couple minutes for that and uh, thanks for joining us today appreciate